All right, let's get started. So uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today we're very happy uh, to have Tracy Slager here today from MIT to be giving our colloquium. Uh, let me give you a, just a brief introduction uh, about Tracy and her, and her history. Uh, she graduated from Australian <coughs> National University in 2005. She then got her PhD in 2010 at Harvard, which is where I had the fortune of first meeting her, actually. Uh, 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 she then went on to Princeton IS as a postdoc before joining the faculty at, at MIT in 2015. Now, uh, uh, Tracy works on uh, a, a really interesting and inter interdisciplinary uh, uh, area of theoretical physics, which is dark matter, which a long time ago used to mean that you would study some very specific dark matter model and probe it in some specific, you know, very narrow set of experiments. But in the last 10 years or so, uh, in part because of her many contributions, there's been kind of an interesting uh, uh, explosion of ideas, both on the theory side and it also in terms of probing uh, the diversity of models in, in, with new experiments. Uh, so very early on, actually, Tracy was one of the very early contributors and pioneers of this idea that the dark matter sector could be much richer and bigger than just a single particle. And in fact, this opened new avenues for probing this type of physics. Uh, she later on uh, uh, found new and novel, interesting ways of probing dark matter, which includes studying high energy galactic uh, gamma rays, basically from dark matter annihilating the sky uh, from imprints of dark matter from the cosmic microwave background and from uh, direct detection uh, through experiments here uh, on, the, on, on the Earth. Uh, in her kind of uh, journey to, to hunt for dark matter, she's also made uh, seminal contributions to actually astronomy. She was awarded the 2014 Rossi Prize, uh, Rossi Prize uh, from the American Astronomical Society, uh, along with Doug Finkbeiner and Meng Su, for the discovery of a huge uh, set of galactic structures which extend far beyond the galactic center, now called the Fermi bubbles, which emit uh, gamma rays and uh, X-rays. Uh, she a, 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 has many other uh, accolades and awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. She was the inaugural recipient of MIT's Future Science Award, and also uh, was awarded the Henry Primakov Award for Early Career Particle Physics from the American Physics. <coughs> So uh, with that, please uh, join me in welcoming Tracy today. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation and for the very kind introduction, Cliff. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. So today I want to tell you about uh, a particular wedge of my work that uh, my group has been working on. The main contributors to this work have been my grad students, Hong Wan Liu, Greg Gridge and Chi Liang Wu, uh, the last of whom is on the job market this year and is very good. So what I want to tell you about is how we can use the cosmological history of our universe as a testing bed for the properties of dark matter. So I first want to say a little bit for those of you who don't work on dark matter all the time about what is the puzzle of dark matter, what we think we know about it, what we think we don't know about it, and why I think it's interesting to dig deeper into astrophysical and cosmological dark matter to try to understand, sorry, astrophysical and cosmological data to try to understand more about the properties of dark matter. I want to give you I want to walk you through the examples of how we can use observations of the early universe using the cosmic microwave background and perhaps in future the 21 centimeter um, emission from the hyperfine line of neutral hydrogen to probe the properties of dark matter and how it might interact with visible particles through a range of different channels. And then at the end, if we have time, I want to tell you about something that is a little bit closer to home, that if you move forward from the early history of the universe to our galaxy, then interactions between dark matter particles themselves can modify the distribution of dark matter. That's been known for a long time and other people here have worked on it. But we've recently been starting to see some, been starting to understand some interesting effects of how that self-interaction would specifically modify the satellite galaxies in our Milky Way. Okay. So let me just begin with uh, the big question, what is, what is dark matter? I should say, I mean, I'm happy to take questions during the colloquium if people have them, but I'm also happy to answer lots of questions at the end, if you prefer. So we think what we know about dark matter is that it's dark. It doesn't scatter or emit or absorb light to a good approximation. So you could really call it transparent matter rather than dark matter. But it does have mass and hence gravity. So these are kind of the defining properties. We believe that it's about 84% of all the matter in the universe, 
We get that information by looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation, sometimes also called the Big Bang afterglow radiation. This is an image from the Planck satellite of what that radiation looks like. This is essentially a snapshot of what the universe looked like when it was only three or 400,000 years old, and I'm going to say more about that later in my talk. But from that, we extract this information that about 84% of the matter in the universe appears to have these properties. We believe that um, the fluctuations in the density of the dark matter seeded in the early universe grow at late times to form a cosmic web that acts as the primordial scaffolding which underpins all the structure that we see in the universe. So this is a series of simulations by, my colleague, by, in, include, by people, including some of my colleagues at MIT. This is the Illustris collaboration going from the bottom to the top here. It's moving forward in time. The left-hand panel is showing what we believe the dark matter is doing. It's forming this web-like structure. Ordinary matter, attracted by the gravitational pull of the dark matter, collects at the nodes of this structure, and that forms the galaxies that we see today. So the right-hand panels are what the ordinary matter, the gas, is doing. And simulations like these can be used to accurately predict the observed behavior of the galaxies, at least on large scales. On small scales, the, the picture is a little bit more ambiguous. So everything that we see uh, in our universe, the galaxies and the galaxy clusters, we believe are underpinned by a dark matter structure. Related to that, we believe that the galaxies that we see are surrounded by large clouds or halos of dark matter. Now, we could guess that from the simulations that I just showed you, but we could also measure this directly, and this was, in fact, where, most, where the first evidence for dark matter came from. By looking at the orbital velocities of stars and gas clouds, we can infer that there's a lot of mass surrounding our galaxy, which we can't see. So the cartoon picture is that we live in a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. This is embedded at the center of a halo of dark matter. And the last statement is, so these are all things that we believe we know about dark matter, but the last statement is kind of a negative one, that if it interacts with other particles, um, not just light, but the other particles we know about, uh, except other than by gravity, then it does so weakly or not at all. And we can set upper limits on that interaction strength by the fact that we have not yet had a firm positive detection of dark matter in any of the searches that we have been doing for the last few decades. Okay, so uh, that is enough information to tell us that if we take the particles that we know about in the standard model, then we can't use the, any of them to explain dark matter. It leaves open a whole lot of questions, like uh, what, what is this stuff? First place. We can break that down into a bunch of subsidiary questions. So what is it made from? Are we talking about one new particle? Are we talking about many new particles? Um, are we talking about like tiny black holes? There's maybe still a little bit of open space for dark matter to be black holes born in the very early, um, but born very early in the universe's history. Yeah. So, so I could. So I, I would say that black holes. I, I would say that black holes are particles. But yeah, if you want to say, um, if you want to say, okay, I want to explain dark matter within the standard model. I think black holes are your best bet. Um, however, to get a large population, you would need them to be, at the moment, the observational window that's still open is around asteroid mass. If you want to make a very large population of asteroid mass black holes that have existed in the universe since very early in its history, you probably need to do something pretty interesting with your inflationary model, which would imply new particles. Uh, they evaporate too fast if they're smaller mass than that in general, unless you have some other correction to the physics which prevents them from evaporating. But yeah, if you're lower than um, about 10 to the 17 grams, the, the lifetime is longer than the age of the universe, but they evaporate fast enough and the photons from that are high energy enough that you would see them in telescopes. So yeah. So yeah. Um, but yes, so you could potentially explain the dark matter itself without invoking you beyond the standard model particles, but you probably have to do some fairly highly non-trivial new physics to get that to work. Uh, that said, there's, um, it, is ki it is kind of a narrow range where that could work, and so there's a reason that a lot of us think about particle dark matter instead. So where did it come from? Why does the dark matter have the abundance that it does? This sort of gets into this question, if it was primordial black holes, you know, what made them? How do they form? But even if we're just talking about some new particle, um, you know, why is that new particle abundant with, uh, present with a mass density that is five or six times that of the normal matter? 
does it actually interact with ordinary particles? I told you we could set an upper limit on the interaction strength, but that doesn't mean it's not there. We know of particles like neutrinos that interact pretty weakly, and the only reason they're not a good candidate for the dark matter is, well, one, we can detect them, and two, they're, um, they're too light and too fast moving to form that cosmic web that I told you about. And I could keep going with this for uh, a long time. There are many unanswered questions about dark matter. Now, if you give theoretical particle physicists a problem like this, then what happens is something like this. Um, so this is a complicated diagram. It's taken from um, slides by my colleague and friend Tim Tate as part of the snow mass process that our field went through about six years ago. And everything within the red blob represents a category of scenarios for dark matter. Everything outside the red blob represents other theories of fundamental physics that, the, those, theory, that those models for dark matter might connect to. And I want you to take about three things away from this slide. So the first thing is that our problem when thinking about dark matter models is not a lack of ideas. You know, it's not a lack of possibilities. We have many ideas for what the dark matter might potentially be, that, um, and these models can naturally give the right abundance of dark matter, and they can explain why it doesn't have interactions that we have seen so far. That is not the hard part. <laughs> The second is that if we, were to under, if we could understand what dark matter was, while that, solve, that would solve a huge problem on its own, but it could also possibly open up connections to other problems in particle physics. Dark matter could be the lightest particle of some kind of, super, of, some kind of spectrum of superpartners of the standard model particles. It could be related to extra dimensions of our universe. It could be related to the Higgs sector or to the neutrino sector of the standard model. It could solve um, deep problems in the structure of this and the structure of how the strong interaction works, the strong CP problem. It could, as Cliff mentioned, it could be just one particle in a new dark sector. It could experience forces that the particles we know about will never feel, the same way that dark matter, we believe, does not experience electromagnetism. So it would be an important question on its own. It could also be a key going forward. The third point is that all the categories of scenarios that I've just mentioned at the moment at least have exemplars which are consistent with all the data. They have the properties that I just told you about. They have, gra they, they have mass, they gravitate, they would form these large structures. They don't have interactions that are already ruled out. And so the question becomes, how do we tell these things apart? How do we exclude them? From a gravitational perspective, they're all identical. So what we can hope to do, though, is look for the non-gravitational in interactions of these particles, either with themselves or with visible particles. If we were to see a positive detection, that would immediately allow us to eliminate the vast majority of this plot, maybe all of it. If we don't see a detection, we can at least set up a limit. We can make, rule out some classes of scenarios. We can decide where to focus our future efforts. So you will notice that pretty much everything I told you about what we know about dark matter came from various astrophysical and cosmological observations, and we've gleaned useful information from many data sets, from looking at the studies of galaxies to light emitted when the universe was only a tiny fraction of its present age. And those data are extremely rich and getting better all the time. We have a large array of telescopes that are continually telling us very fascinating things about our cosmos. So you can ask the question, OK, how far can we go, we go beyond what we already know? How can we use those data to test different ideas for the nature and origin of the dark matter? And one place that we might start from is, OK, let's think about generic ways the dark matter might interact with visible particles or might interact with itself. What would be the effects of those interactions on these cosmological observables? OK, so now I'm going to, if you've seen dark matter talks before, you will have seen um, some of these plus before, although maybe in a somewhat different context. So what are some generic ways that dark matter particles could interact with visible particles? Well, one possibility is that when two particle, dark matter particles collide, I might be able to produce visible particles. This is a common feature in many dark matter models. It's not, um, it's not true in all of them. But so this is like a particle-antiparticle annihilation. In many models of dark matter, the dark matter is either its own particle or it has an antiparticle present. In this case, when dark matter particles collide, they could produce visible particles that we can look for. The, 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 there's a question mark in the middle here, which is the new physics that we would like to understand. This is uh, when the miracle occurs. 
So if we produce known standard model particles, this could be anything in the standard model, this could be quarks or leptons or could be, could be gauge bosons, but if they're not already stable, they will promptly decay. Since we're interested primarily in astrophysical and cosmological searches here, I am free to largely ignore timescales that are much shorter than any of the astrophysical and cosmological timescales that I'm interested in. That means that essentially all standard model decays occur promptly. Um, so what I'll really be looking for is that some spectrum of long-lived known particles that are produced in these annihilations and possibly their subsequent effects. So annihilation, yep, question? Right, so usually when you think about annihilation, you're thinking about, like, if the, um, you're, you're thinking about a case where, like, the total quantum numbers in the interaction are zero. So on the standard model side, you'd typically be producing a particle and an antiparticle. On the dark matter side, you'd have a dark matter particle and antiparticle. Or if the dark matter is its own antiparticle, like a Majorana fermion, then you can just have, it, then it doesn't carry conserved charges and you can annihilate it against each other. You can also have models of dark matter where, uh, the dark matter carries some standard model quantum numbers. And yes, in that case, then you need to make sure that the interactions that you write down adhere to whatever symmetries you don't want to break. So yeah, so I, I'm writing down generic features, but not every model will have structures like this. And, and in some models, even where something like this is possible, it won't happen at late times because, for example, you have a matter-antimatter interaction and all the, you have a dark matter-anti-dark matter interaction and all the anti-dark matter has annihilated away, just like it does in the standard model. Um, Professor Zurek did a lot of the early impactful work on those kinds of asymmetric dark matter models. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about generic structures, but absolutely, like, within any given model, these structures may or may not appear. Okay, so the reason that a lot of attention, one of the reasons that a lot of attention has been paid to annihilation in the past is that there's a category of models where the annihilation rate is tightly linked to the dark matter abundance. That occurs where dark matter was in thermal equilibrium with the visible matter in the early universe. There was a lot of dark matter at early times, and then these annihilation reactions depleted it. So the amount of dark matter that we see today is a relic of that process. And in that case, the abundance of dark matter today is set directly by the annihilation rate, by the annihilation cross-section. That gives you a characteristic predicted annihilation cross-section to get the right abundance that is parametrically about 1 over the Planck mass times the temperature at matter radiation equality, which comes out, when you put it into particle physics units, to about 1 over 100 TeV squared. So or about 2 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. Now, this is also about the kind of cross-section that you would get if you said, I'm going to have a cross-section of alpha squared over 1 TeV squared. So, and that's sometimes called the Wimp miracle, that this is roughly a weak scale cross-section. That might suggest to you that there's some connection between dark matter physics and the physics of the weak scale. But this basic mechanism, annihilation with this cross-section, works to deplete dark matter to the right density value over a wide range of masses um, that's much wider than the classic sort of weakly interacting particle window. And, of course, this also doesn't need to be the origin mechanism for dark matter. If the dark matter was never produced with a large abundance, then um, you don't need to deplete it with annihilation, and its abundance may be set by entirely different parameters of the theory. But I will, in subsequent plots, sometimes show a line, which I say the thermal relic line, that's what this is. So when I say, you know, when we can exclude that line, we're excluding a particular scenario for the dark matter origin. Other generic interaction structures. Uh, the dark matter might not be perfectly stable. It might be able to decay. So again, the picture here would be that the dark matter produces some set of standard model particles. The standard model particles subsequently decay. For cosmological and astrophysical purposes, what we're then looking at is a spectrum of long-lived known particles, so electrons, positrons, protons, antiprotons, neutrinos, which are produced by these decays. Now, this can also apply to non-particle dark matter, as we, just, as we just mentioned. If the dark matter is a population of small black holes, then, um, they will, then they will Hawking radiate. If they're light enough, they will Hawking radiate at a significant rate, and that can give you something that looks very much like a dark matter decay signal, just with a well-specified spectrum. You, this could also be like if we produced the particles in a heavier state, in an excited state, when they decayed down to the ground state, then we would similarly produce a similar signal, even if not all the energy of the dark matter is being liberated. 
So either annihilation or decay, the effect would be that over the history of the universe, there has been a slow trickle into visible particles, apparently from nowhere, but really from the invisible dark component of the universe. And what I want to do in the bulk of this talk, one of the things I want to do is explore the effects of that energy transfer um, on the history of our cosmos. Okay? Again, it doesn't necessarily need to be there, but if we saw it, it would tell us a huge amount. And then the third process, which is less often discussed in the context of astrophysical and cosmological searches, is uh, dark matter baryon scattering. So here we can flip the diagram around and say, well, maybe the dark matter could just elastically scatter off visible particles, again, through some new interaction that we would like to probe. So this is typically searched for on Earth in highly sophisticated underground direct detection experiments. But this kind of process would also have effects on the history of our cosmos because we typically expect the dark matter to be colder than the visible matter. And so this goes in the opposite direction to annihilation and decay. They're slowly trickling heat and particles into the universe. Scattering would slowly remove heat from the visible universe, cooling it down. And we could also consider here the possibility that just dark matter particles can scatter off each other through a mechanism other than gravity. I'm going to set that aside until the end of the talk. But this can, also have, uh, this can also have important effects. Scattering between dark matter particles leads to heat exchange uh, between the clouds of within the clouds of dark matter that I talked about earlier. And that can change how the dark matter is distributed. It can change its density and velocity profiles. OK, so these are the kinds of generic structures that I'm going to be looking for in the rest of the talk. So now let's look at the data sets that we're going to use to do it. So I mentioned earlier that by looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation, you could tell that about 84% of the matter in the universe was dark matter. I'm going to be measuring epochs here by redshift, so which I'll also denote um, z. So 1 plus z just tells us the factor by which the universe has expanded, the linear factor by which the universe has expanded um, since that time. So today, where it's z equals 0, the expansion factor is 1. If I say z of 1,000, that means the universe was linearly a factor of 1,000 smaller. So redshift 1,000 is kind of an important epoch. Because before that, the temperature of the universe was sufficiently high to keep the hydrogen that makes up the bulk of the matter in the universe fully ionized. So at that time, the universe was a tightly coupled plasma of electrons and protons and photons, plus the neutrinos, which are decoupled by that time, and plus, we think, the dark matter. It was almost 100% ionized. But once the universe had expanded and cooled to um, the point that it was only about 1,000 times smaller than it was today in terms of linear scales, then... Um, the, then the temperature dropped to the point that the, just the thermal energy was no longer enough to keep the hydrogen fully ionized. The ionization level dropped off abruptly, and at that point, the photons that had been previously coupled to this plasma started free streaming through space to us. That, period, that point corresponded to when the universe was about three or 400,000 years old. So we see photons today that the last time they scattered on anything in the universe was 14 billion years ago, when the universe was only three or 400,000 years old. And that's called the CMB. So the cosmic microwave background provides a snapshot of the universe at that time. It's the oldest light that we measure. And short of getting observations of the neutrino background or of the gravitational wave background, this is the earliest direct observation that we can make of our cosmos. So there are two kinds of information in the CMB. So we measure it in frequency and also in spatial distribution. So the spatial information, this is the figure that I showed before. So at the, as I said, at rate of 3,000, the universe was basically a plasma, an early uniform plasma. There were small density and temperature fluctuations in that plasma. Those density and temperature fluctuations map into variations in the temperature and polarization of the light that we see across the sky in a pattern that looks like this. The, uh, we can also look at the energy distribution of the CMB, but that can actually be very well characterized by a single number, which is its temperature. This black body hasn't actually been measured since 1990 or so, but partly because the measurement in 1990 was really good. These data points are the spectrum of the CMB, except that those are 400 sigma error bars. So um, this is an extremely well-measured black body. The deviations away from this black body spectrum are less than 10 to the minus 5, and it corresponds to a temperature today of about 2.725 Kelvin. OK, so when we talk about modifications to these data from um, interactions from new physics, and in particular interactions between the dark and visible matter, we can modify either of these quantities, and we can look for either of those changes. Okay, so how can we change the CMBs? There are basically two categories of modifications that we can make. 
Category one is to say, um, well, the CMB is basically a snapshot of what the plasma looked like at redshift 1000, so we can modify the plasma prior to redshift 1000. We can change the target of our picture. Or alternatively, we can, you know, like, like Photoshop, we can change the picture after it's taken. We can modify the photons of the cosmic microwave background as they pass towards us through the universe. So these are mostly, so the difference between these two is mostly a matter of you, when do you make your perturbations? So the classic example of the first case is just that the presence of dark matter changes how the plasma is oscillating because those temperature and density fluctuations in the plasma are driven by the interplay between gravity on the one hand, which tends to cause overdensities to grow, and radiation pressure, which, pushes, which causes the plasma to become less dense, pushes it back apart. If we have a component of matter that only feels the gravity and doesn't feel the radiation pressure, then that changes the balance between those two contributions. And we can use that to, then we can compare our prediction to the data and use that to measure how much of this component we need. So this is a plot from Wayne Hu's website showing what the, um, showing what, so this is showing like a measure of the power spectrum as a function of L, as a function of the multipole number, so as a function of the scale where you have no dark, this pink bar on the right is going to show the total amount of matter in the universe. So it starts off as just being the baryonic matter. And then as you increase the amount of matter in the universe by adding dark matter, you can see that the pattern, how much power we have in perturbations at different scales as a function of that scale can change quite markedly. We can compare this to the data and that's how we get the 84% number for the dark matter of the universe. But so if the dark matter were to scatter off ordinary matter with a non-zero cross-section, that would make the dark matter not quite dark. It would behave a little bit more like baryons. It would feel a radiation pressure a little bit indirectly. So that slight coupling between the dark matter and baryons would modify this oscillation pattern in a way that we can search for. If in another, if other ways to modify the plasma, if we had dark matter annihilation and decay, so we had that steady trickle of heating into the universe, that would also modify this plasma and it would perturb the black body spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. It would take it to higher temperature, but it can also change the shape. So these are sort of type one possibilities. We can look for, um, we can look for scattering in the, and yeah, that we can look for scattering in the modifications to the um, to, to the power spectrum in terms of CLs, also to the black body spectrum. It can cool the, um, the CMB black body a little bit, and we can look for heating in changes to the CMB black body. What about the second type of signature, where we modify the photons on their passage to us from the surface of last scattering when the universe was three or 400,000 years old? So what happens after that in the universe's history? So after the cosmic microwave background is emitted at a ratio of a few hundred thousand, then the universe goes through a period that's called the cosmic dark ages. And in some sense, this period is very simple. It corresponds to an epoch where the hydrogen and helium in the universe were mostly neutral. There weren't any stars yet. There weren't any galaxies. Um, then eventually, at the end of this period, which is sometimes called the cosmic dawn, when the universe was around 100 million years old, then the first stars started to turn on. They produced radiation, which helped ionize the universe. The somewhat later time, the universe went from being almost completely neutral to being almost completely ionized again, as the temperature of the gas was heated up by the stars. And uh, the, the galaxies were starting to form in this epoch. And uh, yeah, eventually, moving forward in time, you come towards something like our present day cosmos. But the simplest part of this to, to look at for constraints is the cosmic dark ages, and even very tiny changes to the ionization state of the universe during the cosmic dark ages can have significant implications for the cosmic microwave background radiation that we see at our telescopes. So this is sort of the standard picture. Photons are emitted from the CMB. They fly to us through the cosmic dark ages. They eventually encounter a telescope like Planck. But if we add extra free electrons in that epoch, they will deflect and scatter and absorb these photons. It will reduce the number of photons that we see, and it will also change the pattern as a function of the multipole number. So we can also, again, if annihilation and decay produce low energy photons at that late time, that will look like it's part of the cosmic microwave background. So we'd get additional contributions to the CMB black body spectrum. Now, I talked about uh, changing the temperature of the universe as well. So that's another data set which at the, at the moment is not, um, 
we don't actually have a detection of this yet, so this is more a future sensitivity study. But um, suppose we want to measure the temperature of the gas at late times. Well, we can measure changes to the temperature of the plasma before the cosmic microwave background photons decouple from the plasma, but just by looking at the CMB. Uh, but after that, it gets a bit harder, until we get down to the period when the first stars are turning on in the cosmic dark ages. There, the hope is that we can measure 21 centimeter Lyon emission coming from neutral hydrogen. So this is the spin flip transition of neutral hydrogen. And we can use that to measure the temperature of the gas at late times and get a handle on any exotic sources of heating or cooling. So, um, of course, the observable that we see is not a Lyon. Um, if we emit a photon with a wavelength of 21 centimeters at redshift 20, then by the time it reaches our telescopes today, its energy will have redshifted down by a factor of 20. So what we expect to see is a broad spectrum. You can also have both 21 centimeter absorption or emission in the early universe. And what we call the spin temperature of the hydrogen characterizes the competition between these two effects. So the spin temperature tells us about how many of the hydrogen atoms in the early universe were in the excited state of this transition versus the ground state of this transition. So they're illuminated by the CMB. That's the radiation source. If we have a hydrogen atom initially in the excited state, then uh, it can de-excite to the ground state, producing emission lines at 21 centimeter and other frequencies. It can also absorb, if we, the hydrogen atoms in the ground state will absorb incoming CMB photons, leaving holes in the resulting emission spectrum. We can look for both of these, but of course, in general, both of them will be happening simultaneously. So the spin temperature tells us which of these is dominant. Um, the spin temperature is just um, the temperature at which the equilibrium abundances are, is, okay. The spin temperature uh, describes, um, as I said, the abundance in the ground versus the excited state. It corresponds to the, if I have a certain ratio of hydrogen atoms in the ground versus excited state, there is a temperature at which that would be the equilibrium ratio. That temperature is called the spin temperature. So if the spin temperature exceeds the ambient radiation temperature, the radiation of the background, that means that there are more particles in the excited state than you would have expected just from the radiation temperature. And so the emission process will dominate. If it's the opposite, if the spin temperature is less than the ambient radiation temperature, then, an absorption, then absorption will dominate. So you can use this and the bright C brightness temperature of the CMB, uh, sorry, the brightness temperature of the 21 centimeter line that you observe depends on how much neutral hydrogen you have around because that's your target. It depends weakly on the various cosmological parameters, the amount of matter and baryons in the universe, and it depends on the difference between the spin temperature and the radiation temperature. So if we can measure this signal, we can get a handle on what was the spin temperature of the gas like at early times. So what do we, so what do we expect to see for this signal? So broadly speaking, I, so again, this is this redshift. This is my expansion parameter. So this is now going from high redshift early times on this side of the plot to late times at this end of the plot. The red and yellow colors here represent an, absorb, um, represent an absorption signal, and the blue and green colors represent an emission signal. So what's going on here is that once the first star, so at early times, the spin temperature of the gas is just coupled to the radiation temperature. So there's no difference between them. We just get zero signal. But when the first stars turn on, that produces, uh, I see there's a question over there. OK. No? OK, just stretching. OK. When the first stars turn on, that produces a flux of photons that tightly couples the spin temperature to the gas temperature. And so then when we measure the spin temperature, we're really just measuring the gas temperature. Now, the gas temperatures, um, and initially, before the stars turn on, we expect it to be significantly less than the radiation temperature. The reason for this is just that if we um, look back to redshifts of about uh, a couple of hundred, the gas temperature and the temperature of the photons are tightly coupled because the photons scatter off the free electrons, the free electrons scatter off the other particles, and that keeps their temperature at the same level. But around about redshift 150 to 200, this process becomes inefficient, the gas um, separate decouples from the background photons, and it starts cooling, and non-relativistic particles cool faster than relativistic particles in an expanding universe. So, this is what we expect the temperature history to look like, where the black dashed lines are the behavior of the cosmic microwave background, and the green, sorry, and the blue line 
is what the gas temperature, how the gas temperature would behave if there were no sources of heating. So no stars, no galaxies, nothing heating up the universe. Um, just, just its primordial heating from the afterglow of the Big Bang. So what we expect is that in this early epoch, once the spin temperature becomes coupled to the gas temperature, we should see an absorption signal because the gas temperature is much lower than the radiation temperature. But as more stars turn on, as more photons are produced, that will heat up the gas. The gas will become hotter than the background radiation and will get an emission signal. And then eventually that emission signal will die out too because the, um, we have enough ionizing photons that the universe becomes almost completely ionized. And then there's not any neutral hydrogen around to give us a 21 centimeter signal anymore. So that's the signal that we expect to see. Um, there are a number of current and future experiments that are designed to search for this signal. At the moment, what we have is mostly upper limits. Uh, there is one claim of a detection. Now, I should say that uh, this claim of it, I have this labeled as side note, not as the main point of my talk, because um, most cosmologists, I think, suspect that this detection is probably not actually seeing a primordial signal. But uh, the EDGES experiment last year claimed to have detected the 21 centimeter signal from the cosmic dark ages from about redshift 15 to 20. This is a picture of the EDGES experiment. It's down in Australia. And what they saw, so this is the map of their signal as a function of the inferred redshift. What they see is what looks like a deep absorption trough starting at about redshift 20 and continuing down to about redshift 15. And that, at first glance, you know, qualitatively doesn't look so dissimilar from what we were expecting. I told you that we um, were interested in looking for a absorption signature. But the thing is, on the previous plot, the scale was about um, minus 100 millikelvin of this, um, of, this of, this, uh, of this signal. And this dip is at minus 600 millikelvin. So it's six times larger than the absorption signal that we expected to see. From the argument that I just gave you, that, what that suggests is that the gas temperature is much colder than it should be, or the radiation temperature is much hotter than it should be in the standard cosmology. Um, either of those are pretty surprising and hard to explain. Um, you could maybe explain them with exotic physics, but the models are all uh, a little bit um, uh, uh, non-trivial. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But OK, so that's how we might look for these exotic signals of heating. We can look in the cosmic microwave background radiation. We can look in 21 centimeter, hopefully, in the future. So let's just do some back of the envelope estimates and try to understand how the interaction structures that I told you about, how that might show up in these signals. OK, so we talked about ionizers. So let's. Um, so let's, let's use dark matter annihilation as an example for a benchmark. And I want to understand how the signals compare from, from ionizing the cosmic dark ages, which modifies the CMB, to adding extra photons, which will change the black body spectrum of the CMB, through to um, heating up the gas, which I could see in 21 centimeter. So ionization first. So if I ask what fraction of the energy stored in the mass of hydrogen in the universe would I need to convert to ionization to ionize all the hydrogen in the universe, that ratio is about one part in 10 to the 8, because hydrogen has a mass of 1 GeV and an ionization energy of 13.6 GeV. So if I could take 1 in 10 to the 8 hydrogen atoms, convert them into ionizing energy, that's enough to ionize everything. There's five times as much mass stored in dark matter as there is in hydrogen. Or less. So that tells me that if I have one in a billion dark matter particles converting its mass into ionizing energy, that's enough power to ionize half the hydrogen in the universe. We would have noticed if half the hydrogen in the universe got ionized during the cosmic dark ages. In fact, the observations of the cosmic microwave background are now sufficiently good that we can tell if as few as like one in a thousand hydrogen atoms was ionized during this epoch, which I always find a little amazing to think about, that we understand the early universe so well that we can tell if one in a thousand hydrogen atoms was ionized when the universe was a few million years old. OK, so this is a huge signal. One in a billion dark matter particles annihilating is clearly massively ruled out. We can probably constrain something closer to one in a trillion dark matter particles annihilating and liberating its energy. What about spectral distortion? What about changes to the black body spectrum of the CMB? Well, let's use this one in a billion number again as a calibration, keeping in mind that we've just established that this is a huge signal and is completely and is going to be completely ruled out. So the radiation and matter energy densities, so the energy density in the CMB and the energy density stored in dark matter, were equal at about redshift 3000. Um, and the ratio between the two scales as one power of one plus z. So 
in the present day, the energy density in the radiation is about a factor of 3,000 lower than the ratio in the, than the energy density in the matter. So if we annihilate one in a billion dark matter particles, that means that we have perturbed, even if all that energy went into perturbing the CMB, that means that we've perturbed the CMB at the level of about one part in 10 to the six. Okay? And like I said, this was an enormous signal. If we do this perturbation at earlier times, it's only going to be a smaller perturbation. So this, and we just, and the sensitivity to changes to the black body, our current best limit is around the level of 10 to the minus five. So if we go down to a signal that's not ruled out by the ionization, then it's, you, then just this back of the envelope estimate tells you that in changes to the CMB, to the energy density of the CMB, it's going to be at the level of 10 to the minus nine or 10 to the minus 10. That might be visible to next-gen experiments. It's not visible at the moment. Yeah? Presumably, this has been uh, factored in, but you say here that the, you have given enough power to ionize half the hydrogen in the universe. Does yes. it actually filtrate fast enough to... Good, good question. So that's why you have to do better than a back-of-the-envelope calculation, which uh, I will advertise on the next slide. But, yeah. But I just want to give you the back-of-the-envelope idea first for how this works. But, yeah, the answer is broadly yes. Like, an order one fraction of the power ends up going into ionization. Also, an order one ends up going into spectral distortion, but since you're down by sort of six orders of magnitude and fundamental sensitivity, it's, it's pretty hard. And what about heating? So down to about redshift 200, if you heat the gas, you also have to heat the CMB. And then we're in exactly the same calculation that we just did. Like the total energy density energy you're injecting is completely minuscule compared to the energy density of the CMB. But at later times, that stops being true. Once the gas decouples from the cosmic microwave background, the baryon number density is about nine orders of magnitude smaller than the CMB number density. So the heating that you're putting in is divided by a much smaller number of particles. We can work this out again. We know there's about five GeV of energy in dark matter for every hydrogen atom. If we liberate one in a billion of that, which again is a pretty big signal, that's five EV of energy for every hydrogen atom. Five EV of energy is about 50,000 Kelvin. So if you were to, so this is again a huge signal. If I were to annihilate one in a billion dark matter particles, I could heat up the entire universe by 50,000 degrees. So that's pretty big. Again, we probably want to be about sort of three orders of magnitude smaller than this. For, um, for signals that won't be ruled out by annihilation. But if you heated up the whole universe by 50 Kelvin at a sufficiently early time, you could possibly see that too. So this is like a pretty big signal. The, the baseline temperature at the decoupling is about 50 Kelvin. So this is an order one change to the matter temperature before the stars and galaxies turn on and start heating everything up. So ionization turns out to be a really powerful probe of annihilation and decay that occurs at redshift after recombination. The CMB spectral distortion... Um, is much harder to use as a good probe, but it's a good probe of physics that um, occurs mostly at times before recombination when you can't look for ionization signals because the universe is already 100% ionized, um, or for processes that just don't put any power into ionization. Like if you're scattering particles with a low momentum transfer, you're not going to ionize anything. The heating, uh, we can't see it in the CMB, but it's potentially a pretty big effect for redshifts bigger than 200. So you can ask, can, can we see this in 21 centimeter? So that's like the basic outline of these different probes. And you know, if you take away one thing from these cosmological studies, what I would like you to take away is there's a huge amount of energy in dark matter. Even a very tiny amount of that energy being liberated can have big effects on the history of our universe. OK, so to go beyond the back of the envelope calculation, um, I, I've done a a significant amount of work on this over the years, but um, the latest version of this work is a public code called Dark History that was primarily co-authored by my grad student, Greg Ridgway, and my former grad student, Hong Wan Liu. It's a Python package. It's available on GitHub. It models the energy loss processes of any high energy particles you would inject through an arbitrary dark matter annihilation model. You can tell it what the spectrum of particles is that you injected. You can tell it the um, redshift dependence of the injection. It accounts, it properly accounts for the cosmic expansion while the cascade proceeds. It allows for a self-consistent, a fully self-consistent treatment of both exotic sources of energy injection like the ones we've talked about and just conventional sources of energy injection like reionization, if the star's turning on. Um, so yeah, uh, if you want to check it out and send us feedback, we would very much appreciate it. And just a little bit more advertisement. Running this is just as simple as saying, you know, 
I want to evolve this system where I tell it if the dark matter process is annihilation or decay, I tell it the mass of the dark matter, I tell it what kinds of standard model particles it annihilates to, and I let it go. It um, is provided with extensive example notebooks. This is the pure advertising part of the talk. It's provided with extensive example notebooks. Um, so, you know, check it out. Let us know what you think. It contains built-in functions for most of the common dark matter models you might want to test. It can include uh, back reaction effects, which is that if you've ionized the universe a lot already at higher redshifts, that changes how the secondary particles cool down and lose the energy, and hence the subsequent effects. You can turn that on or off just at a flick of a switch. And this is just an example of pulling out the, the ionization and temperature histories for one, uh, for one specific example. Okay, so that's... Uh, so you too can now get these constraints. So what kind of limits can we get from this from this approach. I'm not going to go through the details of the code because this is a colloquium and I suspect the number of people in the room who want to know about the details of how the code works is pretty small. But um, if, if you do want to know about it, you know, feel free to ping me later. Okay, so what about annihilation limits from ionization? So this was the thing that our back of the envelope estimate said should be a pretty powerful bound. So you can actually show, using tools like dark history, that the effect of annihilation on the um, anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background is universal in the sense that over a very wide range of possible dark matter models, the effects all have the same imprint on the CMB up to a single normalization factor. Um, that's a non-trivial statement. I can say more about why it's true if people are interested later. So what that means is that you can essentially take a template of changes to the cosmic microwave background, and that is the template for dark matter annihilation, essentially independent of what it annihilates to. <laughs> Uh, you can test for the presence of that template, you can get an upper limit on its coefficient, and that gives you a limit on a huge range of dark matter models. Um, unfortunately, when they tested for this, they did not find a detection of this, uh, of this template. They put an upper bound on it. This is what the upper bound looks like when translated into the annihilation cross-section as a function of the dark matter mass. These different colored lines correspond to predominant annihilation into various particles in the standard model and everything about above the corresponding line is ruled out. This black dashed line is what I told you earlier was the thermal relic cross-section. The x-axis here is the mass of the dark matter in GeV. It cuts off at about 5 GeV here, but these lines just keep going down and down and down, down to the KeV scale. So essentially what this tells us is that if you have that thermal relic cross-section, if you have a thermal relic with annihilation into visible particles, any visible particles that aren't neutrinos, um, then either you had better find a way to suppress that annihilation at late times, like having asymmetric dark matter where the anti-dark matter has gone away, um, or, you, um, or you need to find a different origin mechanism for your dark matter because the thermal relic cross-section would just provide too much ionization of the universe during the dark ages. So that's an example of the kind of thing that you can, uh, that you can do with the ionization limits. You can do the same thing to look at decaying dark matter, which, as I said before, you, you can also um, use this to look at Hawking radiation from black holes. Again, what you find out when you do this is that um, you can set some of the... So this is not quite as strong as annihilation, but you can set some of the strongest limits on fairly light dark matter below the GeV scale, decaying to leptonically, so producing electrons and positrons. Um, this is the, so these colored lines here show the limits on dark matter decay to electrons from looking at photons in our galaxy. The black line, so this is a number of different analyses, partly done by um, Professor Zurich here. The, the black dotted points show that everything beyond this is ruled out by the one CMB analysis. So the kinds of lifetimes that you can test through this are lifetimes of about 10 to the 24 to 10 to the 25 seconds. So that's about seven to eight orders of magnitude longer than the age of the universe. Um, you can also use this to test the possibility that maybe there was another species like the dark matter, but it already decayed away. So um, you know, it, it was there, it was the dark matter, at some, it was part of the dark matter at some point in the universe's history, but it decayed away into visible stuff and it's gone now. If that stuff had, a, if that extra component had existed and had a lifetime of 10 to the 14 seconds, then it has to be less than one part in 10 to the 11 of the dark matter that we see today. So we can put constraints on very tiny, as we said before, we can put constraints on very tiny fractions of the dark matter, converting their mass into visible energy during an epoch that we can see. What about um, the heating constraints? What about the 21 centimeter constraints? Again, you can use dark history or 
similar tools, but dark history is particularly good for this problem, to forecast if I had my favorite model of dark matter or exotic energy injection, what would that do to the temperature of the universe at late times? And if I had a 21 centimeter measurement, then what kind of limits could I place? So you can do a sensitivity forecast. The sort of expected level of the depth of the 21 centimeter absorption trough is about minus 100 millikelvin. So suppose I made it a 50, suppose, suppose I measured it to be less than 50 millikelvin, to be um, less than minus 50 millikelvin, so amplitude greater than 50 millikelvin. At, uh, at a redshift, we'll pick 17, because that's the redshift that Edges looked at. That corresponds to an upper limit on the gas temperature of about 20 Kelvin at that time. If we could do a measurement like that, then for light dark matter decaying leptonically, we would improve the bound by two orders of magnitude beyond the CMB constraints that I just showed you. So this is just an example. This is the limit on this red line is the limit on the lifetime bound that you would get from such a 21 centimeter observation. The black line is the limit that comes from the CMB, which in turn is stronger than the indirect detection bounds in the low mass end of this range. Now, if you believe the edges result, you can say, okay, well, um, that had a really strong absorption trough. We can set a limit from that. You need to be a little bit careful here, because in this case, you need some other new physics to explain why the absorption trough is as deep as it is. But it turns out that in that case, you, in, we tried, uh, my student Hongwan and I scanned over a bunch of different possibilities for what that new physics would be. And we found that in general, you could still, in that case, set pretty strong constraints on dark matter decay, which are, um, which are at, at, a, at a similar level with a substantial improvement over the previous bound. So once we get a 21 centimeter observation that we can believe, unless it corresponds to a, a pretty, um, which may be edges, but there's probably edges with a confirmation. Once we believe a 21 centimeter measurement, then it's very likely we'll be able to put very strong constraints, particularly on light decaying dark matter. Okay, what about if we wanted to explain edges? Everything that I've just been talking about is annihilation or decay, which heats up the universe. Um, for edges, we have this very deep absorption trough, so we want to cool it down. So you could ask the question, uh, can, if we allow the dark matter to scatter on the visible matter, could we explain edges? Well, certainly dark matter baryon scattering could cool down the ordinary matter. The question is, um, how much, how strong do you need that scattering to be to cool the ordinary matter by an order one factor? So if we have strong dark matter baryon interactions, well, first, we might see them in direct detection experiments on Earth. Those experiments tend to lose, the current experiments tend to lose sensitivity below the GeV scale, but there's a lot of active research, as Cliff mentioned, into how to look for lighter dark matter candidates at the moment. Even if we set that aside, as we discussed earlier, if dark matter scatters on the baryons, it will change the cosmic microwave background, both through energy transfer into the uh, changing the black body spectrum and modifications of the plasma that change the power spectrum. So putting that together, the best case scenario for getting a strong 21 centimeter signal from dark matter baryon scattering is a scenario where you've got low mass dark matter, so the direct detection experiments have trouble seeing it, with a cross section that's really enhanced at low velocities, because the velocity, typical velocity of the dark matter is lower at the, in the 21 centimeter epoch than in the CMB. So about the strongest velocity scaling that we see in our regular physics is a V to the minus four scaling in the cross section. That's Rutherford scattering. Um, now you may be like, wait, hang on a sec. How can I have dark matter that's undergoing Rutherford scattering? That's, um, that you know, belongs to charged particles. But let's, uh, let's go with that for a moment. Let's see where that goes. So my student Chiliang and I studied the effects of dark matter baryon scattering in the early universe. We, set, we um, worked out limits. Uh, we worked out limits on this case of Rutherford light scattering in the CMB. We bounded what the cross section that you would have. And then both for that case, for n equals minus four, and for other velocity scalings of the cross section, we said, okay, given the limit from the cosmic microwave background, what is the maximum temperature change that you could get at the redshift relevant for edges? And that's what the second plot is showing. So the blue points show n equals zero, minus two, minus three, and minus four. The red line shows, so this is showing the maximum temperature change consistent with the CMB limits. The red line is showing what you need for edges. And like even V to the minus three scaling is not enough. You really need it to look like Rutherford scattering if, if you want this case to be true. Now that, if you want the dark matter to undergo Rutherford scattering, it probably needs to couple to some very light mediator. That's extremely highly constrained. 
So to get around this, several authors suggested that, okay, maybe not all the dark matter undergoes Rutherford scattering. Maybe only a small fraction of the dark matter undergoes Rutherford scattering. In that case, you need to make the cross-section larger because only a small fraction of the dark matter is scattering, but, um, but you can get away from the CMB constraints because if you have a small enough of, amount of dark matter uh, interacting, then you're not going to change the anisotropies of the CMB very much. It's just like having extra baryonic matter. Um, so the detailed studies on this have found that there's maybe some space that can work if there's a Rutherford scattering dark matter component that is between 0.01 to 0.4% of the dark matter in the mass range between about 0.5 and 30 MeV. Now, and usually in this case, what people do to avoid the need for an extra light mediator is say, right, okay, if it's only this fraction of the dark matter, we can just make it electrically charged. Um, so we can give it some tiny milli charge and, uh, and okay, and then that's not excluded by collider experiments. Um, there are a number of different ways to search for these milli-charged particles, but one way that we looked at was, again, you can go back to these cosmological constraints. The CMB constraints that we used so far were the ones where you modify the plasma and that modifies the, pat the, perturbation, the pattern of anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background. But you can also just look at the total heat flow and how that modifies the black body spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. And that, um, just like the 21 centimeter at a much later time is just measuring the total energy transfer and it doesn't really care what fraction of the dark matter is undergoing it, just how much total energy is transferred. So on this plot, we're showing the parameter space for milli charged dark matter that explains edges, that's the black line, if 1% of the dark matter carried the milli charge. And then the red line is the constraint that you would be able to get from a proposed next generation experiment looking for spectral distortions. At the moment, the constraints from 1990 on the black body spectrum, not strong enough. But this is an example of the case where you might be able to learn something from spectral distortions. Okay, and I see that I'm nearly out of time, so I just want to talk briefly about something that's uh, a, bit, a bit different. So I hope I've convinced you at this point that if there are non-trivial interactions between the dark matter and the visible matter, then it could have non-negligible effects on the history of our universe from very early times through to, um, through to the formation of the first stars. But of course, um, many searches we don't, our information about the universe does not end at the epoch of formation of the first stars, and many searches that I haven't talked about focus more on how could we look for signatures of those interactions at late times. And then that also opens up the possibility of looking for the effects of interactions between dark matter particles and how that would change this cosmic web structure that I talked about earlier. Now it turns out that most of this cosmic web structure wouldn't change very much if we turned on an interaction between dark matter particles. But at small scales, uh, where the dark matter is dense and slow moving and, um, and, and where we can wait for a billion years to see what happens, then it could have interesting effects. And that's not novel to my work, that's been known for quite some time. But what we wanted to look at that was, um, that was interesting was um, how a lot of the work that had previously been done on dark matter self-interactions looked mostly at isolated halos. But we can see within our own galaxy, there are what's called dwarf satellite galaxies of the Milky Way which are small clumps of stars, and we believe lots of dark matter, that orbit around the Milky Way's core. So we can ask the question of, okay, what happens once you have to take into account both self-interaction between those objects and the interplay with the larger halo? So this is just some basic parametrics of dark matter self-interaction. Basically, if you take an estimate of what kind of cross-section do you need to get a meaningful change to the, um, to the dark matter distribution, you want the average dark matter particle to have scattered once in the dynamical time of the system. For typical systems that we'll look at, that gives a cross-section divided by the dark matter mass of about one square centimeter per gram. For self-interacting dark matter halos evolving in isolation, we think we know how they work. There have been a number of simulations on this. What we believe happens is as the halo evolves, it develops um, sort of a low density central core of relatively flat density. But if you wait for long enough, that core will collapse in on itself and the center of the dark matter halo will actually um, become small and dense and highly compact. So since my time is up and I want to give some time for questions, I just want to say like the sort of few minute summary of what we found. So we took these self-interacting dark matter halos and we allowed them to propagate into a larger halo. 
what we were interested in here was the interplay between the self-interactions within the small halo and the gravitational effects from the larger halo. So we actually turned off the self-interactions between the small halo and the larger halo. The justification for this is that the small halo was moving pretty fast through the larger halo, and in a lot of particle physics models for this self-interaction, the um, interaction is enhanced at low velocities and suppressed at high velocities. But really, the reason we did this was just that we wanted to be able to disentangle the effects. You could do a larger simulation where you also looked at the halo, um, subhalo scattering. And we ran some simulations where we tested what this would do for um, dark matter halos on different orbits, uh, coming in with initial concentration, coming in with different initial um, concentrations, so halos that were more compact and halos that were less compact, falling in. And what we found was kind of cute. So this is the, so this is the basic idea. It turns out that when you throw a smaller halo into a larger halo, then tidal effects can strip off the outskirts of that smaller halo. And this acts like a positive feedback effect on the original uh, density of the halo in the context of self-interacting models. So if a subhalo comes into the large halo when it's in the first phase of the evolution I talked about, so it's pretty low density in the center, it's got a big flat core, the effect of the tidal stripping is very destructive. It, um, it, the the, the subhalo doesn't have a very strong gravitational potential, so it, so, uh, it loses a lot of mass, the core, gets, the core gets larger and larger. That's sort of what's shown in the lower plot here. Black is the case with no self-interactions. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Black is the case where you... Um, do, black is the case of a field halo where it doesn't fall into the large halo. Blue and red are cases where, um, you, where it falls into a large halo on orbits that spend an increasing amount of time close in to the halo. So in this case, the usual density decrease of the self-interacting dark matter halos when the density goes down and it forms this core is accelerated by the presence of the large halo. But if you throw this halo into the larger halo at a point where it's already, its core is collapsing, it's already compact, then this has the opposite effect. In this case, you still lose the outskirts of the halo to tidal stripping, but the central part of the halo just collapses faster and faster and gets more and more compact. So what you end up with is this sort of divergent evolutionary trajectory where, um, depending on what stage this halo is, if its trajectory when it falls in, what its initial concentration was, it either gets much, much denser or it becomes much less dense. <laughs> so you have this divergent result. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to... So what this would imply is that one, diagno one diagnostic feature of self-interacting dark matter models might be that we have a broader diversity of dark matter density profiles in satellite galaxies than we would expect from the case where we have not turned on these self-interactions because of this positive feedback effect between the gravitational stripping and the effect of self-interactions. You'd also expect, because this is an environmental effect, you'd expect it to be, um, you'd expect it to depend on what kind of orbit the satellite has. Now, we did a really preliminary survey. We haven't done any kind of detailed calculations of what the, result, what the distribution of halos with these two different types of uh, trajectories would look like. And so this is, so we can't at this point do like a detailed contribution to the data, but exploring this might potentially give you some observational handles that would allow you to set upper bounds on the self-interaction strength of the dark matter or detect evidence of it. Okay. So let me just sum up. So I hope I've told you that astrophysical and cosmological data sets are enormously rich. They can provide very powerful probes of the non-gravitational properties of dark matter in addition to what we've already learned about its gravitational effects. And they can test a huge range of possible scenarios. The CMB is already giving us very stringent bounds on dark matter interactions with the standard model, such that we can largely exclude thermal relic models with unsuppressed annihilation below 10 GeV. Scenarios that are not yet ruled out could still have pretty large effects on the matter temperature at the end of the cosmic dark ages. I told you that it could have, you know, order one changes or larger to the matter temperature. Equivalently, 21 centimeter measurements could set very powerful constraints on dark matter interactions with the standard model, especially dark matter decay. We've developed more advertising. We've developed a new public numerical toolbox called Dark History, which allows you to, given your favorite dark model, model of choice, compute the resulting changes to the ionization and thermal history of the universe. And this last little bit at the end, um, if you go beyond dark matter standard model interactions and just look at dark matter self-interactions, that 
the presence of those interactions could imprint themselves on the properties of satellite galaxies in the Milky Way. In particular, the interplay between the self-interactions and the tidal stripping gives rise to this broad diversity of expected properties for the satellite halos. Thanks very much.